Okay, let's start this. So, uh, welcome to my talk, Sorting Faster Than N-Log N, Generalizing and Optimizing Radix Sort. Um, I've started you off here with a graph showing a benchmark. I will talk more about benchmarks at the end. This was just for you to look at before, before we start. Um, so you can see the punchline right ahead, which is that um, the Radix sort algorithms, they can be easily twice as fast or more than standard sort. <coughs> um, today we'll be talking about the line in the middle here, about um, scar sort, the red line. The one at the bottom is also interesting, but that's not for today. Good. Um, who am I? My name is Maltes Karobke. I'm an AI programmer at Avalanche Studios in New York. We make video games like Just Cause 3 there. Um, I also blog at probably, probably, probably dance.com. Um, this work came out of my own private work. I also use it. I also use it at Avalanche Studios, but it's I didn't make it there. So what are we doing today? There's two parts to this talk. Part one, we're going to write a radix sort and then generalize it. In part two, we're going to optimize it and talk about how fast this is and what the complexity is and, and all that stuff. And at the end, we'll finish with how you can use this yourself, how you can go home and replace your uses of sorting with um, radix sort. OK. So when I started, uh, or when I said about giving this talk, I got this quote, which says, uh, radix sort is on pretty well trod ground. I'm not sure anyone needs to see a talk about it. Uh, so why do I give a t talk about radix sort in the year um, 2017? And um, it has a lot to do with uh, this book, From Mathematics to Generic Programming, by Alexander Stepanov and Daniel Rose. Uh, I read this book last year, and it has a theme of um, taking algorithms, starting off from a simple algorithm, and then generalizing it, and over the years finding new use cases for it. And then often from those, new use from those new use cases, finding improvements for the old algorithms again. And um, yeah, just making simple things more general. So I just read this book when, uh, shortly after, after reading this book, I finally learned how radix sort works. So that I was kind of already in the mindset of, in the mindset of I want to generalize this and make this more widely useful. Um, so I, I try to find a quote in the book that, um, illustrates this theme of like revisiting old algorithms and generalizing them and optimizing them or finding new use cases and all that. And the quote that I found was uh, this quote. It says, in this chapter, we saw two examples of how continued exploration of an old algorithm can lead to new insights. Even a classical problem studied by great mathematicians may have a new solution. When someone tells you, for example, that sorting can't be faster than n log n, don't believe them. That statement might not be true for your particular problem. So the story I had in my head might not be quite true because maybe this book just planted the idea straight in my head. Maybe it just came from this paragraph. But um, yeah, basically it tells you you should look at sorting again. So that's that's what I did. What if, what if someone tells you a com comparison where sorting cannot be faster than any logarithm? You should probably um, believe them. Yes, yes. That's the, the comment was um, comparison based sorting cannot be faster than n login. And that is that is true. Um, the second quote I got about this was um, when I showed my benchmarks to one of my coworkers um, before I posted my blog post on anything, and he said, uh, if these benchmarks were true, we would be radix sorting everything. And this was like the most experienced guy at my company, and he just couldn't believe it. Um, and that is the reason why we're here today, because the benchmarks are true, and I do think that we will be radix sorting much more in the future. I think it will be, yeah, as prevalent or more prevalent as comparison-based sorting. Uh, it can't quite sort everything, but um, the cases that it can sort, I think we were using it. So I kind of want to get a baseline of what you people know. So I want to just have a raise of hand. Who, who has heard of radix sort, at least before coming here? That's everyone except for one. Okay. Uh, who actually knows radix sort? Like, who could tell me how it works? Like, don't actually tell me, just I want to know. Oh, uh, that's far fewer. That's only four. Um, there's one subtlety to this previous point. It can't only sort ins. It can actually sort anything that can provide integers as a sort key. So if you have a, like a struct that you want to sort and it has an int member, then you can sort by that int member. So radix sort is already a little bit more general than just sorting ins. It seems like this point often gets lost because people just think of it as integer sorting, but it can sort anything that you want to sort by ins. Um, there's one more question which I have which is, uh, who knows that radix sort has been generalized already to work on floats and strings? That's almost the same people that know radix sort. That's... Hmm? I read your blog 
Oh, because you got my blog post, yes. <laughs> Good. Um, that makes sense then. Um, okay, let's build a Radix sort. So Radix sort's interesting because it doesn't use comparisons. Um, instead, it uses um, well all kinds of tricks, bit shifts, uh, bit mass, point arithmetic. You can be actually can be quite creative on using Radix sort. It's kind of fun. Um, in fact, I've given this talk a few times now to practice and almost every time somebody came up to me afterwards and said, hey, you could use this trick to make it even faster. And I think most of the people are spot on. So it's kind of fun to, to write a Radix sort. Um, but staying in the spirit of the book, we we'll start with a simple algorithm and then generalize it step by step. So we start with something that can only sort single bytes. So like say, I want to have a, have a thousand bytes, I want to sort them, all the zero bytes in the front and all the one bytes, all the two bytes, etc. cetera. Um, good. The algorithm is called counting sort. And uh, when sorting bytes, the idea is that there's only 256 possible values that, that any given byte can have. So what we do is we just count how often does each of these values appear. And we just put this array on the stack of our counts and we just increment the values in there. We iterate through once, count all the values. And then um, there's a neat trick that I will have to show you in a second where you can use the counts to directly place each element where it has to go. Um, it'll be clear once I walk through it. So this is kind of the notation I'm going to use throughout the talk. So at the top, I've got my input array. This is what I want to sort, the array 1, 5, 4, 0, and 0. And then below that, I have my counting array. And normally, the counting array would be 256 elements wide. It's just for the slides, I kept it at eight elements wide so that it make it easier to follow. Um, good. So what I do is I just count how often does each element appears. So I have a 1. I go to index 1. I increment the count. I have a 5. I go to index 5. I increment the count there. Uh, I have a 4. Increment the count. I've got two zeros, so I increment the count in index zero twice. So we've counted. There's two zeros: one, 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 four, and one, five. Um, the next thing we do is we build a prefix sum out of this count, and the prefix sum tells us up to this point in the array, what do all the, what do all the numbers add up to? So in the first slot, they all add up to zero because there was nothing before this point. But then we add a two to it, so now everything adds up to two. We add a one; everything adds up to a three. We add a zero; still three. We had a 1, it adds up to 4, adds up to 5, and everything in this area adds up to 5. And we don't need the last value in this case, just as a, it just works out even without looking at the last value. Good. And so the trick is now that um, after having the counts and building the prefix sum, um, this prefix sum can tell us directly where to put things. Because we can index into this prefix sum and we can ask how many elements come before me. So if, if I'm like number 5 and I I index into here and I see that there's four elements before me. I just put myself at index four. And then I, I will be out of the way of everything that comes before me. Um, I'll walk through it once to make, make it clear how that works. So I shuffle things around a little bit. Input array is now on the top left. Prefix sum is on the top right. And I have an output array. So counting sort is a copying sorting algorithm. So it puts the sorted data into a different array than the input um, data. Um, so what we do is we take the 1, we index into the prefix sum, tells us that there's two elements before the 1, so we put it at index 2, and finally we increment the count in the prefix sum. Um, next we find the 5, which we put at index 4, because that's where it wants to be, and we increment the count. The 4, we index into the prefix sum, there's three elements before it, so we put it at index 3, increment the count. 0 wants to be at index 0, put it there, and this is why we're inc incrementing the count, because the second 0 now wants to be at index 1. Right, so in case there's multiple bytes, a multiple byte with the same value, we have to increment the count in the prefix then. So this guy wants to be index one. Um, so just like that, we've sorted this array. And it, 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 we just iterate through the loop, through the, through the um, content twice. This is what it looks like in code. It's, um, well, I'll walk you through it slowly. So at the top, we've got our input, which is the u and 8 uh, begin end. And uh, I've got a second array, which is my result array. The result array has to be the same size as the input array. I'm not checking for that, it just has to be. Um, so what I do is I initialize my counting array on the stack, just set it all to zero. Then I, it, then I run through the input array once and just increment the count for every single value, always indexing into the counting array. Um, next, I build the prefix sum, and this loop is slightly more complicated because I'm building the prefix sum in place. So I'm overwriting the counting array. I'm just reusing the counting array. Um, so what I do is I write the total and then increment the total, write the total, increment the total. It's a bit complicated, but not super complicated. And the final loop, 
as where I, where I iterate over the input one more time, and I use the um, I index into the counting array, which is now the prefix sum. So I index into the prefix sum, use that again to index into the result array, and at that position I write the I write the value, and I also have the plus plus in there to increment the counts. So I do it all in one line, so it's a bit complicated, but you can kind of see how it works. Yes. We see that we are doing three passes, right? First to uh, calculate the counts, and then mm -hmm. finish the prefix sums, and then filling the output area. Um, so three passes, three in. Um, yes, actually, the so next slide has complexities. So it's unfortunately hard to see because the comments are a bit dark. But I claim, yeah, so this is O of n. And I say that the first, um, so there's four loops here. The first loop is kind of implicit because we're just initializing memory on the stack. But the first loop is O of 1, because there's always 256 steps. The second loop is O of n, because we iterate through once. The third loop is again O of 1, because um, it's always exactly 256 steps. It doesn't matter um, how many bytes we're sorting. If we're sorting 10 bytes, it's 256 steps. If we're sorting a million bytes, this loop is still 256 steps. So that makes it O of 1. Well, yes. That means it can only sort numbers from 0 to 256. Yes, we're only sorting bytes at this point. We we'll generalize it further later, yes. Yeah, so um, as for the question, why, why are we building the prefix sum? Like, why not we directly populate the output area um, from the counts that we have in the first place? Yes, um, so the question is why don't we directly um, populate the array from the counts? Why do we have to build the prefix sum? Yeah. Um, it's it's very easy to understand if you if you just wrote this code or if you try to debug it once yourself. Let me think about how to explain it. But the problem is um, we have to like every time we increment the count, we have to increment the current count and all the values after it. If we did, if you were to build it directly, so it would just be more work. Like it. it oh, yes, another comment. Well, when you're just sorting bytes, it actually would be easier just to say how many zeros do I have? Two, zero, zero. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then you're not exactly sorting in the generic sense. Like it works for bytes because all bytes are equal bytes are identical. Right, but if you were sorting like collated strings, you could you could say I have one, it's even hello. Oh yes. Yeah, like if you're doing yeah, that, that would be right. Right. if you don't you didn't scale sort kind of thing, you want if you have two yep. values which map to the same key and you want to put them in the right. Okay, makes sense. Yes, yeah, so once again for the for the for the uh, microphone there was a discussion of we could just write the values directly. And and that is true, but um, the next slide actually explains why we're not doing that. Um, so yeah, but, but anyway, so the final loop is once again O of n because we just iterate through once and we put every element exactly where it has to go. There's no uncertainty in that final loop. Um, okay, so um, also explaining why we can't just write the numbers. Um, we can already make this algorithm a little bit more general because we can, um, we can, this can not only sort bytes, but it can sort anything that provides a byte as a sort key. Um, so if you have like, if you want to have a bunch of I don't know, if, if you want to sort, some, sort something that's only a single byte in size by, by the sort key. Um, the way we do that is we add a bunch of templates, and I'll walk you through it one more time. So I made the input iterators and output iterators um, generic as templates. Um, and I added a final argument which I call extract key. And this extract key, that's a lambda function, which or some kind of callable, that um, where the job is to for the given generic value, give me a byte that I can sort your values by. Um, so if I have like say I have a bunch of containers and I want to sort them by length, and I know that none of them are longer than 256, then I could I could return the length in this extract key function. Otherwise, the code is mostly the same. In, in, the, in this first loop, we now call extract key before we index into the counting array. And same thing in the final loop, we also call extract key before we index into the prefix sum. Otherwise, it's the same loop. OK. Um, I have one example of how to use this, which is um, I have a vector of strings, and I want to sort it by the first character only, because that would fit into a single byte. So I have my input, uh, vector of string input, vector of string output. I make sure that the output is the same size as the input uh, list, so I can copy into there. And then I call counting sort with begin end in the begin of the output array. And in my extract key function, I just return the first character in the string. So I'm assuming that all the strings are not empty, but then this would just sort all the characters on the first string. That's kind of how you would use this extract key function. OK, let's generalize it more. So when generalizing counting sort, there's um, two paths you can go. You can either keep 
the copy, so keep it as a copying um, algorithm, or you can make it in place and use swaps. And depending on which path you go, you end up with two different radix sorts. One is called the least significant, least significant digit radix sort, other one is called the most significant digit radix sort. Um, they both have different benefits and downsides. Um, the top one is often faster, but it hasn't been generalized yet to work on strings. The bottom one has been generalized. So the bottom one seems like a better candidate to, um, to, to make a fully general algorithm out of. And the other reason is that we want to probably use swaps because we want a replacement for standard sort, and standard sort's in place, so we want to have a swapping algorithm. So in this talk, I only talk about the um, swapping radix sort. The other one's also interesting, but that's too much for, the, for one talk. So let's just try swapping. Um, so what if we just run the previous algorithm, but now we swap everything into place instead of um, copying to a different array? So uh, this time I've, I, I, want, I want to swap, swap the number one into place. So I index into the prefix sum, where I find the number two. So it wants to be an index two. So I swap it with that, and then I increment the count in the prefix sum. I move on, I find the number five, which wants to be an index four, according to the prefix sum. So I swap it in place and increment the count in the prefix sum. Now I find a one, which wants to be index three. So I swap it and increment the count. Now I find the number one again, and this doesn't look right anymore because now the number one wants to be index four. So we swap it into place and increment the count. Find the number one again, it wants to be index five now, so now we're indexing out of bounds. So clearly we just can't just um, replace the copying with a swap, that doesn't work. But luckily for us, this is already a solved problem, and it's a solved problem in an algorithm called American flag sort. And the name is a bit strange, so I'll explain the name first. Um, so this is an algorithm called standard partition, which takes a bunch of, which takes a list of, in this case, black and white elements, and it puts all the black elements in the front, all the white elements in the back. Or you could take like numbers, all the even numbers in the beginning, all the odd numbers at the end. It's generic, you can provide your own predicate. Now there was a so-called Dutch, Dutch flag problem, which was named by Edgar Dijkstra, so he named it after his country's flag, which is what if I want to sort, swap, uh, what if I want to um, call partition, but I want to put it, put it in three different sections. So I want to put all the red ones at first, and all the white ones, and all the blue ones. Um, and you still want to do that in linear time. You still just want to go through the array once. And then, so there was the uh, further problem with what's, what's the American flag problem, which is what if I have many stripes on my flag, and I want to partition into many different stripes. And um, so in our case, we want to partition into 256 stripes. And we want to do that in linear time. OK, what does American flags all do? It's a slight modification to the previous algorithm. Um, so first, we use a second copy of the prefix sum. And we can use the second copy of the prefix sum to see when we are done swapping a certain element. Um, it's not obvious how that works ahead of time, but I'll I'll walk you through it and then, then it'll be clear. Just for now, remember the second copy is to know when we're done. And this other thing we do is that we keep on swapping the first element until we find something that actually wants to be in the first element. And only then do we move on. Both of these will be clear once I walk through it. Um, so I've got the same input array, output, uh, input array and prefix sum. And once again, normally the prefix sum would be 256 slots wide, but we just keep it at eight slots for the, for the slides. And I have my second copy of the prefix sum now. And the second copy is shifted over once to the left. Um, so I just write the value one earlier. And I can get the second copy of the prefix sum uh, for free in the same loop that I wrote the first time. Um, I just have to like allocate more memory on the stack and then just write the one value earlier and the other value later. Um, but it doesn't make it any more expensive. OK, so how does this work? So we want to swap the number one. So we index into the prefix sum. Tells us we want to be at index two. So we just swap it with that and then we increment the count in the prefix sum. Next, I find the number four. I don't move on, I stay on the first element. Number four wants to be at index three, according to the prefix sum, because there will be three elements before it at the end. So I swap it with that and increment the count in the prefix sum. Now we find a zero, and the zero wants to be at index zero. So it's already, it already is where it wants to be. So we just increment the count, and this is our condition for moving on. So we stay on the first element until we find something that wants to be there. Next, we find the five, which wants to be index four, swap it, and then increment the count. The zero is already where it wants to be. We just increment the count and move on. And now the one, what we find now in the prefix sum is we find two values that are the same in these two copies of the prefix sum. And that tells us that we've already done swapping all the ones into place. So we can just skip over this guy and move on. 
Same thing for the four, it's already done because the two values are the same. And same thing for the five, the values are the same. So like this, we sort this array. Okay, so let's generalize this. Um, so I've made this table of all the primitive types that we have, and um, I've highlighted the U and 8 because so far we can sort U and 8s. And we're gonna fill this whole table out and, and sort everything in here. So we can sort U and 8s. There's a few other types that are nearby that should be easy to sort, which are the other types that are only one byte in size. Um, and so looking at the first one of those, it's the int 80. Um, we can't just use that right away because for a signed int, there might be negative numbers in there. So um, if we use that to index into our array, we would index out of range. But actually an audience question, does anyone know how we would sort int 8s? Just thinking about it briefly. Reinterpret cast? Yes, that works. Then that's the better solution. Yes, so the reinterpret cast, it works, but it puts them in the wrong order. Because then all the negative numbers have a really high value, and um, and um, they, would, they wouldn't sort before the positive numbers. So the solution is we add 128, as was mentioned over there. So um, yeah, we reinterpret cast and then add 128. That keeps them in the right order, but we just shift everything over. So all the negative numbers now are in the positive range. We can use them to index into the counting sum. Or, or you take a pointer to 128 elements into the... Yes. That is, that is the thing I haven't tried yet. But that, that, that was also, like the, the comment was, we can also just move the pointer up so that the, point, the base pointer is at 128 elements into the array, and then all the offsets would, be, would work out. Um, that's one of those clever tricks about radix sort that I mentioned at the beginning that I want to try. I haven't tried it yet. Could you explain that to me? Um, yes, so um, the question is, could I explain that? So, um, well, do I want to, because I'm also Oh, okay. Not super loose on time, but let me. Yes, but the idea would be that um, so instead of indexing it into the array normally, we just put a pointer that's at index um, 128 into the array, right? So we just put the pointer right in the middle of the array, and then when we use the int 80 to index into it, we might get negative indices, but the negative indices would totally be fine in that case because they're still indexing into the array, because our pointer starts in the middle. If we get a negative index, it would would still fall within the valid range, and they would still all be in the right order. Okay, uh, next type, the char is even easier. We just cast the u and 8. We don't have to do anything else. This gives us the same sorting order that standard sort gives us, and that's what I wanted in this case. And the bool is actually even easier. We just use standard partition. So you can imagine, like, you have to kind of write templates for this to figure out, oh, if the extract key function turns a u and 8, I have to do the normal thing. Otherwise, I have to, like, do this casting and add u and 8. You need to check if char is signed first. It might not be. Yes, the comment is we have to check whether char is signed. Um, that is correct. I didn't check on my platforms. Um, it actually... Static assert. Yes, static assert we do for that, uh, is, is the comment. Um, good. But yeah, for booleans we have to do something else entirely, so you have kind of have to like construct your code a little bit cleverly, but that, then you have it. Um, after that, after I was a one byte type, so the next easiest type is the u in 16. Because it's unsigned and unsigned are easier, and it's just one byte more. And it shouldn't be that hard to sort one byte more. So here's a bunch of uh, u in 16s I want to sort. I've got the numbers 100, 1000, 10, 1, and 10,000. And I want to sort this array. And to help with the solution, I'm going to also put what they look like in bytes. So number 100 has 0 in the first byte and 0x64 in the second byte. Number 1,000 is 3 in the first byte, and 0x e8 in the second byte, and so on. So can anyone tell me, just based on this, how we can sort as 2 byte un16? You sort the first byte first. Yes, okay, we just sort in two passes, first byte and then second byte. So we just use an extract key function. We provide an extract key function that only returns the upper byte of this uh, un16 in the first pass. So then as far as the, this algorithm knows, it's just sorting these numbers and swapping them back and forth. Okay, um, that's pretty straightforward, so I just sorted it. Now we end up with the array 100, 1, 10, 1,000, and 10,000. So small numbers are still in the wrong range, but the big numbers are in the right uh, order. So um, now we can't, after sorting on the first byte, we can't just sort on the second byte, because what would happen now is that the, um, for example, this 10,000 has a pretty low value in the second byte, so it would be shuffled back to the front. Um, but what we, what we also have is we have this side array on the stack, 
which is our finished prefix sum. And this tells us um, that there was three values with a number zero in the first byte. And then the, uh, the and, and the numbers um, with three in the first byte, they go from index three to index four. Like wherever this value differs, we, can, we know that there's a new range that starts here of values that have the same byte. Like if there was multiple values with three in the first byte, then the, the jump there would be bigger. So what we do is we sort within the subranges that um, end at each of these index indices. And then we use the second byte as a sort key. So we just recurse down into the subsection, we sort that on the second byte, and then we go back out. And the other ones we don't actually have to sort on the second byte because there's only one element in those subranges. Um, but if there were more, we would also have to recurse down there and, and also sort those. Is that actually faster than just sorting in the other order? Start with low order by the time um, The question is, is it faster than sorting in the other order, sorting on the low order byte and then the high order byte? Right, because then, then it just falls out naturally, right? Yes, so that is the other radix sort. That's, that, that one is the, um, the, that is the copying radix sort. Like that one, I don't think anyone has figured out how to make that one in place yet, um, because it's just you just do this and then you just do this again. Oh no! Yes. So no. Yes. So the um, the comment is we, we why don't we just do the same thing in the other radix sort? So the problem with um, I'm not sure if I can illustrate that based on this, but the the um, the least significant digit radix sort relies on the fact that every single pass is a stable sort. And this is not a stable sort. Um, and so we cannot use the same trick that the least significant digit radix sort uses. Um, so, and to make it a stable sort, we have to make it copying. So, um, since I didn't talk about that, I'm not gonna go into that much further because it's, it's a bit of a niche case, but um, nobody has figured out how to, how to do that yet in place. Okay, so. Now we support the UN16, and then there's other easy nearby types, which are the other types that are two bytes in size, IN16 and CHAR16. And those, we just do the same tricks that we did for the one byte types. We just reinterpret cast and add an offset for the assigned one, and for the CHAR, we just cast a UN16. Okay, and um, using the same trick of sorting on the first byte, and then recursing into the section, we all have the same value of the first byte, and then sorting those on the second byte, and recursing down and sorting on the third byte, we can actually just do all of these. So all of these we just sort one byte at a time, all the integer types. Um, and the same thing also works for the pointers, we just sort one byte at a time. So that leaves these types, floats and doubles. And they are more complicated because they have different bit patterns. Their bit patterns are more complicated. They don't have as easy of a meaning as the, as the integer types. Um, so let's look at what a float looks like. A float has um, one sign bit eight bits for the exponent and 23 bits for the mantissa. And if I draw in the lines for where each byte ends, there isn't like a nice subdivision there. That's like, it's like slightly off. Can anyone tell me based on this how to sort floats? Just based on this one picture. Shifted, Shift it. that's a comment. Um, that's correct, but let me drink something. Yeah, so the comment is shifted and that, that um, totally works. So what we would do is we would first sort on the sign bit, called standard partition on the sign bit, put all the negative numbers first, then shift everything over by one bit to the left, and then sort one byte at a time. Um, that works, but that's five passes over the data. And somebody called uh, Michael Herf has figured out how to do this in four passes. And for that, we have to look at how, what these actually mean. Um, so what I tried is I kept the mantissa the same and changed the exponent bit. So last 23 bits are the same, the gray bits are the same, and every time I change the exponent bits, the number doubles. That's how floating point numbers work. And then also I tried keeping the same exponent and changing the mantissa. And for this, I think I changed the third bit in the mantissa, so I changed a bit that's pretty high up, so the change is pretty big. Um, but the, 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 the key point to take away from here is that changing the mantissa always stays within the range of two of these values in the exponent. We can never overflow into the next range. In fact, we'd have to overflow the mantissa. If you, if, if you were to overflow the mantissa, then we would go into the next, um, and go into the exponent, then we would go to value two. Right. Wouldn't you get the negative numbers in reverse order? The question is, wouldn't I get the negative numbers in reverse order? That is correct. You're like two slides ahead of me. Uh, <laughs> that's, <coughs> um, that's good. 
Yes, but anyway, so the point, the, the thing to take away from this is that um, all the important bits are already on the left and all the unimportant bits are already on the right. Because the exponent bits are strictly more important than the Mantessa bits. And so based on that, we could um, just sort one byte at a time. Or maybe we can. Um, and that actually works for positive floats. Um, and the first, problem, the first problem we run into is that uh, negative floats would come after positive floats, but they need to come before positive floats. Because negative floats would have the highest bit set in the sign bin, and um, that would make them a very high unsigned, uh, would, make them, would, would make them count as a very high numbers. So the solution for that is we just flip the sign bit. And the second problem is what uh, Igor said, is that uh, negative floats would sort in the wrong direction. And the solution for that is we just flip all the bits. Um, so for positive floats, we flip the sign bit. For negative floats, we flip all bits. You can kind of imagine doing this in your extract key function, figuring out, like, is a sign bit set? If yes, flip all the bits, otherwise flip only the one bit. Um, and then after that, return the byte that you're currently sorting on. But otherwise, this is just sorting one byte at a time. So floats work, and doubles work the same way. We just sort one byte at a time, and we flip the sign bit of positive doubles and flip all bits of negative doubles. Okay, I'm gonna grow this table a little bit and add uh, containers. I've got two different rows here. I've got my random access all out containers and I've got my uh, not random access all out containers. And what I mean when I say I wanna sort uh, containers, I wanna have something like this, like a vector of vectors. So the nested type is the container type. <coughs> okay, so the easiest type out of this is if I wanna sort a vector of strings. How do I sort a vector of strings? Audience question. It's not a trick question. It's if you think you know it. And strings are arbitrary length? Yes. Strings are arbitrary length, yeah. Well, this is where the most significant like, there's also it makes it a lot easier to get the most significant like, first. Yes, the common is the most significant, most significant digit radix sort makes it a lot easier. Yeah, because we just do the same as everything else. We just sort one byte at a time, right? Or in this case, one try at a time. As I said earlier, the try does reinterpret castle to U and 8, so it ends up being, so it's just one byte at a time. Okay, this is a good point because we've reached the point where this is what radix sort could do as of last year before I worked on this. Um, so boost spread sort can sort these types because of integers, floats, and strings. So let's generalize this all the way. Um, so I've got these other containers like vector, deck, array. So let's say I have a vector or vector of ints. How do I sort that? Auditory question. What do you mean by sorting vectors? Yes, what do, what do I mean by sorting vectors? This doesn't come up that often, that's true. Like, like most, um, so if I have two vectors and one vector has the numbers one, two, and three in it, and one vector has the number four, five, and six in it, or? Oh. It's a lexicographic. Yes, a lexicographic. Like for standard sort, it does lexicographic compare for these. Um, I can't do that because I don't use comparisons. Now what I do instead is the same as everything else, I sort one byte at a time. Or well, in this case, one element at a time. So I sort in the first byte of the first element, then in the second byte of the first element, till I am through all the bytes of the first element, then I go on to the first byte of the next element, until I keep going down, until I can tell all the elements apart. Right? So I, just, I don't have to go through all the bytes, I only have to go far enough that there's only one element in the list in the recursion. Like, um, um, like, like earlier in the UN16, we didn't have to recurse down into the later sections. So I just keep on recursing until I can decide these are sorted. Okay. Um, next is the non-random access um, order containers. Oh, I don't have the unordered containers in this because it doesn't make sense to so so sort unordered containers. If I have a vector of unordered map or something, you can't sort that. So I only, I only have ordered containers. Um, so vector of set is more complicated because I can't ask a set give me like the third byte in your fourth element or something. I can't just ask it to give me a specific element. Um, so what I did for these is I actually I just don't support them. Um, because they don't come up that often and they're hard to do. I could do them by just keeping, by every time I want to access a certain element, I just iterate from the beginning. And I've tried that and it's actually not that slow. It's still roughly comparable to standard sort. But it just, it just feels like if you want to sort these, you can continue using standard sort, and I think that's fine. Could you catch the iterator for each element? The question is, could I catch the iterator for each element? I, I've also thought, of, thought about that, and that's also worth doing. I haven't tried that one because I don't like having heap allocations in here, because I haven't had them so far, and I don't like introducing them for a few edge cases. 
Um, yes, yeah, so there's there's I, there's several possible ways to do this. I just haven't done any of them yet, and I think it I think you just should just use continue using standard sort if you have this edge case of sorting a vector of sets or something. Um, so I leave these as red. Um, let's scroll the table further. I'm going to add pairs and tuples. Um, they get sorted the same as everything else, one byte at a time, or one element at a time in this case. Um, at this point, your templates actually get quite complicated because tuples are complicated. And then um, the first element might have a different type as a second element. So I might have a pair of bool and float. And then for the first element, I have to do call, call standard partition. For the second element, I have to do all my bit flipping tricks that I do for floats. But if you set this up right, it just um, it just all works out like automatically with all the nested types. And it even works out that you can then sort a vector of pairs of whatever. <coughs> okay. So then that leaves uh, your own types. So sorting your own types is more complicated because I can't just iterate through your members. And I probably don't want to iterate through your members because I don't know what the meaning of your members is in your type. Um, so what I decided to do for these is I'm, um, I'm I just say you have to provide a sort key function using any of the above supported types. So if you can build your sort, if you just want to sort on an int, you can just return an int from your sort key function. If you want to sort on something more complicated, maybe build like a pair of, of like int and int or something. Um, so let's go through a few examples. So I have a called, struct called programmer, has a string first name, string last name. And let's say I want to sort these by last name and then by first name. So if, if, if two people have the same last name, then I want to sort them by first name. Um, the way you do that is, oh, okay, here's my list of programmers. And um, what I do is I call uh, scar sort, which is my sorting algorithm, programmers begin, programmers end. And in the extract key function, I return standard tie of last name and first name. And standard tie returns a tuple of, of references. So in this case, it returns a tuple of string references. So then my algorithm would be like, oh, you want to sort this in a pair of strings. So I just sort one char at a time on the first string. And then if I can't make a decision on the first string, I sort one char at a time on the second string. Yes, the question. Um, have you considered adding a second parameter to your lambda that takes the uh, byte index? Have I considered taking a second parameter to my lambda that takes the byte index? I think that's actually, I need to look at what spread sort does. I mean to look at that. I think spread sort. Maybe doesn't make much sense. To yes. So I like, I like keeping it this simple, where you just have to return a single value, and then internally it does all the right things. Because, um, so the byte index, then you would, then you yourself would have to like f figure out how do I return like the fifth byte right now. And, um, you need a, you need a top limit on your string assignment. Yes, and yeah, it would get complicated, because then you would have to figure out, oh, the first string is only four characters long, and then I have to advance to the next string. I do all that internally correctly, um, automatically. And you don't want, so I didn't want to expose that complexity of figuring out which is actually the, the byte and which bit flipping tricks do I have to do and all that stuff. Uh, I have another example. This is something I was actually doing at the time at work. I have a bunch of enemies. I want to sort them by distance to player, but I want all the ones that are in combat with player to come first, sorted by distance. All the ones that are not in combat come, to come later, also sorted by distance. So the way you do that, let's call one second scar sort, enemies begin, enemies end. And then the extract key function, I return make tuple of is in combat with player and distance to player. So that will sort first on whether or not they're in combat. And then within the range where there's the same value, it will sort on distance to player. And in this case, I return make tuple instead of tie because, um, well, last time I returned, I did standard tie because I wanted to return references because they were strings and it's expensive to copy strings. And make this is just sorting boots and floats, so it's cheaper to return um, them by value. And the other reason is that the boolean here is actually a temporary, because I flipped the boolean, so I can't um, I can't return it by reference. Just yes, question. Myself, uh, the third parameter to the SK sort is the uh, key extract function. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The last argument is the last parameter is is the extract key function. Well, actually, this is like one level above the extract key function, because then my algorithm looks at your provided lambda and builds all the necessary extract key functions out of that. Okay, so I claim like that I can support your types uh, because if you can build a sort key out of the above types, you can build anything. That's what I claim because once you have tuples and pairs and you can nest them arbitrarily deep and all that, uh, you can build anything out of that. So that's 
actually end up generalizing. So the question is, uh, one question I have is like, why didn't anyone do this before? Because just a few slides ago, we were at the point where um, that was the state we, we, that was the state of the art as of like a year ago, when we had the above and string, and now we have everything. And it really wasn't that complicated to get from that point to the point of supporting everything, right? It's just all oh, these are all that work the same way, just sort everything one byte at a time. Um, so my answer for that has a lot to do with this book, because this book already put me in the right mindset when I read it. So I was already thinking, oh, this, I want to generalize something. And then this radix sort came along and I finally learned how radix sort works. So I already was like, oh, how, how far could I take this? And the answers then came pretty clear, came pretty quickly because I was in the right mindset. But the other thing to take from this book is that um, these things also just take a lot of time. Um, so in this book, they talk about algorithms that were invented like hundreds of years ago. Like say an algorithm was invented 1400 something, and then it was revisited and generalized in 1500 something. Another person found an improvement in 1800 something. And it just takes like a long time for these algorithms to like evolve over the years. So I think it's also totally fine for the previous people who worked on this, like the people who made it support floats, for example, to say that they only add the support for floats and then they move on and work on whatever else, whatever else they want to work on. So it's, it's fine to just do like the one thing and then move on. Okay, so that was the end of part one. I'm actually doing pretty fast on time. But um, yeah, so part two is optimizing this, so making this faster. And I think this is actually pretty important that I also made this faster at the same time, because somebody had actually done similar work in uh, Haskell before, but since it was Haskell, I think people didn't pay as much attention because they didn't think it would be fast. And um, so I had, to, I had to actually make something that would be faster than standard sort, um, otherwise people wouldn't pay attention. So before optimizing, we are, I'm gonna go one more time through how this looks, how this works. So we're gonna sort this array on the left, which is now a little bit longer. But since it's a linear time sorting algorithm, it will still go pretty fast. Because you kind of have to understand, like you kind of have to get a gut feeling for what this algorithm actually does. So once again on the right, I've got my prefix sum, which I got by counting all the numbers, uh, counting all the values, and then adding them up. And normally this prefix sum will be 256, 256 elements wide. It just kept it at eight elements for the slides. So let's sort this. So I've got my number three. I look in the prefix sum. The number three wants to be index three, because there's three values before it. So I swap over that and I increment the count. Next I have a seven, which wants to be at index uh, seven. So I swap over that and increment the count. I have a six, which wants to be at index five. I swap over that and increment the count. I have a four, which wants to be at index four. Swap and increment. I have a seven, which now wants to be at index eight, because this is our second seven. So I swap over that and increment the count. I have a zero, which wants to be at index zero. So this is already where it wants to be. So I just increment the count in the prefix sum and move on. I have a six, which wants to be index six, swap it in place, increment the count. A zero is already where it wants to be, increment the count and move on. I've got a two, which is already where it wants to be, increment the count and move on. And like that, I'm done. So let's look at what that looks like in, in the video. Uh, let's see. Okay. So this is a visualization of sorting algorithms. It's a program called Sound of Sorting, but I turned the sound off for the presentation. Um, and here we can see it's swapping a bunch of elements into place. It will start over in a second, and then I'll um, explain how this works. Um, good, so now it's sorted. So the first pass through, we just count all the elements, and in the background, we are building the prefix sum. I'm not visualizing the prefix sum here, but you just imagine there's an array on the stack in the background. And then this swaps every single element into place. And it's kind of fun to watch because every element just ends up exactly where it has to go. If you look at other sorting algorithms, it's much more like oh, I'm going to move everything roughly over here and then everything roughly over there and like it's these waves of things moving around. And this guy just like puts everything right where it has to go. I'm not visualizing the uh, recursion here. So I'm only visualizing like sorting on one byte. Like the recursion would kind of work like would sort this into 256 small partitions that are not quite sorted within the sections and then would recurse down in there and fill, th fill things around and fix it up in there. So it's hard to visualize because of so many small partitions. Um, <clears throat> okay. The other thing to take away from this is that the red element, the element that we want to swap, it rarely moves on from the beginning of the array. It always stays like, like it has to find something that already wants to be in that slot 
and it's pretty unlikely that it finds something that wants to be in that slot. It still swaps everything else into place, but it, it just always usually stays in the beginning. And that would be important for um, optimizing the fact that it keeps on swapping the same element. Yeah, and oftentimes by the time that it moves on, the array is already mostly sorted. So I let this one finish, and then I go back to the presentation. <clears throat> All right. Um, let me find my mouse. Okay, so where's the spending time? I'm going to show you some disassembly. Um, I don't expect you to read it. I expect I, I'm going to walk you through it slowly and show you what what everything means. Um, okay, so this is the um, inner loop of, well, this is the output of a program called perf, which you use to profile things in Linux. And um, this is the inner loop of, of, of the sorting algorithm. Um, so it's a pretty small inner loop. It's just 15 instructions here. And most of these instructions are pretty cheap. They're just moving like bits around and like doing some address calculations. Um, what's important is the lines in red. The lines in red is where this is spending most time. Um, and what all of these lines in red have in common is that they're all pointer fetches. So what does it mean if all my slow operations are pointer fetches? Cash miss. That's also what I thought, and it's actually not a cash miss in this case. And uh, it does lead you in the right direction if you go that way, but um, this algorithm is actually really friendly towards the cache because um, what I have is I've got my, my prefix sum on the stack, which is like, um, I think it's two kilobytes in size, and my L1 cache is 64K. Um, so that easily fits. Then I've got my swapping elements, which um, the left one's always in the cache because I mostly stay on the same element. And the other one, so if I'm sorting a long array, like say a million uh, ints or something, then um, you might think that you will get a lot of cache misses going into all those random places where you're swapping things back and forth. But there's actually only 256 possible points for me to swap into. So in those, after the first few swaps, all those 256 possible points will all be in the cache. So there's actually, I actually almost get no cache misses here. Uh, instead, the problem here is that all these depend on each other. And um, if you remember when I walked through it, I always had to go from the left to the right, from the right to the left, and always jump back and forth. And so I always have to um, get, the result of the previous get the result of the previous operation before I can even start on the next operation, before I can even start computing the next, next index to look into. So I profiled this on an um, Intel Haswell machine. And the Intel Haswell does four instructions per cycle. So every single cycle, this CPU can run, um, can like look at four instructions and start working on them. And next cycle would start the next four instructions, start working on them. And um, if I have a pointer fetch and I have the best case where everything's in the L1 cache, that still takes four cycles on this machine. So even in the very best case where everything is like perfectly in the caches, in the time it takes to fetch a single pointer, this CPU can do 16 instructions. So it could run this entire loop, correctly predict the branch at the end, and then start on the next iteration of the loop in only the time it takes to fetch the first pointer, even in the very best case. So what happens here is that the CPU is kind of just bored. It could, like, it could do so much more work, but we're not giving it enough work. It has to always wait for the previous thing to finish before it can start on the next, on the next um, operation. Okay. So looking at this again, um, the first intuition, if the CPU is bored, we kind of want to do loop unrolling or something. We want to somehow give it more work to do. Um, but this is where it's important that it keeps on swapping the first element, because I don't know how to unroll that in a loop. Because I always, I always keep on swapping the first element, and I have to wait for the previous one to finish before starting the next one. So what I kind of want is I want to say that after swapping the first one into place, I want to swap, swap the second one into place. Because if I just iterate through the loop, then I could unroll that, and then I could advance all the way through and um, do more things in parallel. We tried that earlier, and it didn't work. Remember, if I just walked through, I would eventually index over the end. But what I didn't have at that time is I didn't have the second copy of the uh, prefix sum. In the second copy of the prefix sum, it can tell us which items are not yet sorted. So, so far, we've used it to tell us which items are finished, but we can also use it to tell us which items are not yet finished. So the intuition, well, after looking at this for a while, you realize that what you want to do is instead of iterating over the one on the left, you want to iterate over the loop on the, on the right. And what I'm, um, 
I'm going to show you first, I'm going to walk through it once and just show you what the access pattern of this would, would be like if I iterate over the one on the right. I'm not going to do any swapping the first time around, just showing, the, just showing you how this, how this works. So for this first element, I'm going to iterate from index 0 to 2 on the left array. So I'm going to iterate over these two values. For the next one, I don't have to do anything because it's already finished. For this one, I only have to iterate, iterate over one element, so over that 2. For this one also, over the 7, I iterate over one element. Um, for this one, I don't do anything. For this one, I iterate from index 5 to 7, so that one and that one. And for this one, I iterate from index 7 to 9, this one and this one. So let's look at what that looks like if I also do the swapping. So first, I want to swap this 3 into place. So I look on the right, the 3 wants to be at index 3. So I swap with the 7 and increment the count in the prefix sum. Now I move on to the next element. I find the number 6, which wants to be at index 5. So I swap it into place and increment the count. Now I move on. And um, this is the 2, which is already where it wants to be. So I just increment the count and move on. The, um, now I iterate from index 4 to 5, which is just this one number. 7 wants to be at index 7. I swap it and increment the count. Next, I have the 6, which wants, uh, I, I iterate at index 6, where, where I find a 0, which wants to be at index 0. So I swap it into place and increment the count. I, um, at index 8, I find another 0, wants to be at index 1 now, because I incremented the count already. Swap it into place and increment the count. At this, one, at this point, we've gone through the array, and it's almost sorted, but it's not quite sorted, because there's a 4 at the end that shouldn't be there. Um, the good thing for us is we're still in a valid state because the array on the right-hand side still tells us which items are not yet finished. So what we do is when we get to the end, we just start from the beginning. And what I actually do in the real algorithm is I keep all the ones that are um, not yet finished, I keep them on the left, and all the ones that are finished, I put them on the right in this prefix sum. So I shuffle them around so I don't have to iterate over all the finished ones again and again. But I didn't visualize that here because it makes it too complicated to follow. So we just start from the beginning, only going over the ones that are not yet finished. So iteration 4 to 5, find the 6, it wants to be at index 6, swap it, increment the count. I find the 4, it wants to be at index 4, swap it and increment the count. We start from the beginning, there's only one element left. It's already where it wants to be, just increment the count, and we're done sorting. <coughs> so that's what this looks like, what this, what this works like. Um, and I claim that this has correctly cut the dependencies between the, the, all the instructions, because now if you look at the first two swaps, they're all accessing different elements. Um, and so the CPU can start on the, second, on the second, second iteration before it has even finished the first iteration. And so this is instruction level parallelism. If, if we ran this across multiple CPUs, these guys would stomp all over each other because there's plenty of cases where they do access the, where they do access the same elements. But since it's within the CPU, um, it can correctly see, oh, there's a dependency here. In that case, I just have to wait. And if there's no dependency, I'm just going to run ahead and keep doing more operations. Could you parallelize on the second byte? Could I parallelize on the second byte? I cannot because I first have to sort everything that has the same value on the first byte. I first have to sort all those together. And only once all those are in the same range, then can I start recursing into the second byte. But, but then you have a set of ranges. Oh, yes, yes, that, that's a good point, yes. So once I have done the first pass, <clears throat> I could do all the recursive calls on the second byte. I could do all those in parallel. Yes, that is correct. Also, is there um, a particular reason why you swap the elements uh, while you're sorting, rather than um, maybe take a temporary um, loop of value into that, keep hold of it until it's um, in the right position? Um, the question is, why do I swap and not like store it in temporary place until I find the right slot for it? Um, the reason why I don't do that is that I haven't tried it. I, I just, uh, this is pretty fast, so I haven't, it might make sense. But this is also, so I'm only showing you the path that actually works, but there's plenty of paths that you can go down here that don't work. And I'm not yet sure if your path is before, it would be one of those where you accidentally end up indexing over the end or something. So I'm not, I'm not yet sure if that, it might work, it might, and it, it might be worth trying. I, I think I uh, can uh, quick sort. Mm -hmm. can do that instead of just swap, swap, swap. Mm -hmm. It holds onto one value until it's in the right place and then it drops it back down, shifting, moving all the values as it goes. You actually don't need swap to do quick sort. Well, yes, you need, yes. You need move, not, not swap. Yes. 
Yes. From a generic point of view, it might be easier to swap things, and then it looks like it's uh, yes, it can be. But but then you, you're 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 swapping the you're doing um you're moving two values around mm -hmm. in the heap a lot rather than just one with each operation. Yes, I'm just saying that would be a yes. Yeah, yeah. It really depends on yes. Yeah. Okay, so for the microphone, there was a discussion in the audience about um, how in quicksort you don't necessarily need swap to implement quicksort. You can just do it only using moves and whether the same thing would apply here. And yeah, my answer is just I haven't tried it. I don't. It might work, but I don't. But you're always swapping. Oh, you're, you're swapping bytes always, right? I am. So the question is, do I'm, I'm swapping bytes? And the answer is no. I'm swapping whatever type you give me. Um, and I'm only using the byte to index into the counting array. So once I've done all the thing with the extract key function, right, like that, I get a single byte out of that at the end, which is maybe like the first byte, maybe the second byte, maybe it has done some, some like uh, bit flipping between the original value and me, but um, the swap is always the original value. I'm not swapping the bytes that I actually get. The, the, the return value from the extract key is only used as an index. Okay. Um, yes, so before I did this optimization, it ran at 1.6 instructions per cycle when I measured it. After it ran, it ran at 2.2 instructions per cycle. So CPU is just doing more work at the same time. Um, gives me 40% more instructions per cycle, and it ended up being like something like 30% faster in a direct comparison. If I directly compare the, old, the American flag software to this, it's roughly 30% faster. So it's not quite the full speed up that you would expect, but that's because this new algorithm actually has slightly more work, because I have to jump back and forth one more time. But that slightly more work disappears because I, I can do more instructions per cycle. I can do more in parallel. Okay. Let's look at that video too. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, so this is um, what the new algorithm look lo looks like. And um, so the first pass was the same. We just count how often each value appears. And now the active element, the one that we're swapping, it goes through the array. We iterate through the array. Then we go through the array a second time, faster this time, because we're skipping all the ones that are already finished. Then faster again, and then it's finished. Let's look at it a second time. So the first pass through, we just count and build a prefix sum in the background. And second pass through, we're swapping all the red elements into place with a blue one always. Um, first time through, we just swap all of these. Second time through, we skip all the ones that are already finished. Third time through, we go even faster and we um, so we do a few passes to, to the, through the array, but it usually finishes pretty pretty fast. And I say that this is still O of n because I always do exactly n swaps because every element ends up exactly where it has to be. Um, so even though I do multiple passes, it's actually only exactly n op operations because I, um, I skip all the ones that are already finished. And the, the case for like in the prefix sum, we have to iterate multiple times. That is not super slow because I keep all the unfinished ones together. So I don't have to iterate over the finished ones over and over again, which is something I didn't show. Okay, let's go back to this. Okay, um, how fast is this? I'm going to start you off with a um, 30 minutes. That's, that's pretty good. I'm doing really good on time. Okay, I'm going to start you off with this, with, a, with a benchmark uh, with, with a graph that's not super useful, but I'll use that first graph to explain to motivate why I did my graphs the way I did them. Um, so this is um, the speed of sorting integers, and I've got like different um, number of items. So I want to sort like longer or shorter lists. And so on the x-axis, I have a log scale where I um, always double, double the number of items. And in profiling things, you always want to use a log scale because performance on, CP on computers changes in changes on the log scale because caches work on log scale and the recursion works on log scale and many things work on log scales. But once you have a log scale on the x-axis, you also want a log scale on the y-axis because otherwise the curve just goes straight up at the end. Um, but then what happens is that uh, on a log-log scale, the n log n algorithm looks like a linear line. So what I claim is the top one is n log n and the bottom one is O of n. But uh, it's hard to see that here. I also claim the bottom one is like two or three times faster, but you also can see that in the log-log scale. So what I did instead is that I um, do this, which is on the x-axis, I still have the number of elements on a log scale. On the y-axis, I have the cost per item. So if I'm, thought, if, if I'm sorting a thousand items and I take 20 nanoseconds per item, the total sort cost was 20,000 20, nanoseconds. 
Okay, so on this, this is um, what most of these performance graphs look like when you measure this. So at the top, we've got standard sort, which is n log n. So what we see is as the number of items double, its cost goes up linearly, which is this is actually a beautiful graph for n log n. Um, at the bottom there, I've got scar sort copy, which is the algorithm I didn't talk about, and I'll explain in a second why I didn't talk about it. But I claim that the algorithm at the bottom is completely 100% O of n. And that's what O of n looks like, it's just a flat graph. There's one bump in the middle, but that's because at that point, the data doesn't fit in my cache anymore. So then it gets a little bit slower, but otherwise it stays flat. Um, so scar sort, the more generic algorithm, the one in the middle, it doesn't quite look like O of n because it has these waves going on. And the cost keeps on going up after each wave. And to explain those, I first have to explain why they all have the same value at the beginning. And um, so in this algorithm, I have a bunch of fixed overhead for building the um, prefix sum and for initializing the counting array. If you remember at the beginning, I always had to do exactly 256 steps for building uh, all my uh, state on the stack. And um, if I'm only sorting like 10 items, that overhead of doing 256 steps, that like totally dominates. So what you do for small lists, uh, for or what I do for small lists is I actually just fall back to standard sort. So I say, if your list is less than 128 elements in size, I just call standard sort directly and uh, finish up. And then what happens is at first I have to pay my, like as, as, I'm, as I'm departing from standard sort, I have to pay the cost for all this overhead. But then as I'm sorting more and more items, I can amortize that overhead cost across all these items. So the cost per item goes down at first. Um, but then what happens is as I'm sorting more and more elements, like let's say I'm sorting like a thousand elements, um, I'm, sorting them, I'm sorting them to 256 partitions, and maybe each particular partition is only like 10 elements in size, so they're too short for my cutoff, so I just call standard sort within that small range and finish it off like that. But at some point, um, these recursive ranges, they get big enough that I have to once again pay all this overhead for building my state on the stack and do the full, um, do the full sorting on this. So as I'm doing more and more of these recursive calls, my cost goes up, and that's the first wave that we're seeing there, where, um, uh, sorry, yeah, so that's the first wave that we're seeing there is doing more and more recursive calls. And there's at most 256 of those recursive calls, so at some point those are finished, and I can amortize the cost again across all these items, until I get to the third wave where I have to do recurse down to the third byte. Okay, so because of this graph, I claim that my complexity is O of n times b, where b is a number of bytes that we need to look at to tell elements apart. Um, so how often do we have to recurse? Which is a pretty vague definition because it depends on a lot of things. Uh, one thing to say is when sorting ints, b is at most four, because I can have at most four of those waves, and um, after that I would be done. So that b number, it depends on what types you're sorting and what, what the input is like, what the distribution is like, so it depends on a lot of things. But I like it best because it can explain all of the following graphs. Um, so I'll show you a few more graphs. The first graph is just the example from earlier, sorting a pair of bool and floats. And the reason why I have this one here is just to, just to tell you that most of these graphs look the same. Most of them have like these waves going on. Because I'm about to show you a bunch of graphs that don't look like this. Um, but I want to illustrate most cases would, would have looked like this. And I'm now going to show you a bunch of ed edge cases that look different. So here is um, a case where what if most of my ints are close together? So now I'm using geometric distribution as my random number source, which puts, which generates mostly ints that are close to zero. And every once in a while it generates ints that are further away, but the closer you are to zero, the, the more likely you are to be generated. I think the numbers go up, up to 10,000 here, but they're really, it's really rare that you hit a number that high. So I thought this would be my worst case because what happens here is that all these numbers are the same in the first two bytes. They just have zero in the first two bytes. In the third byte, they are maybe a little bit different, but most have the same value there. Most have like zero or one in the first byte, and the third byte. And only in the, only in the last byte do I actually have to do work. So I thought this would be really slow because I have to pay all the overhead for the first two bytes, and then I don't do anything there. But I actually, I detect that case because if I, if, if I just detect they all fall in the same partition, I just straight away move on to the next byte and don't even do anything in the first byte. Um, and then in the third byte where they are only slightly different, like most values have, most have value zero or one in the, in the, in the third byte. Um, that's actually a really good case for me because what happens is that um, all of the, um, what happens if, if they all fall into a few partitions is I get really nice long un uninterrupted loops. Um, 
because most of the values in the prefix sum will already be finished. And the ones that aren't finished will have very long ranges. And um, yeah, those just end up being my best case because that's where the loop unrolling kicks in the best. So only on the last byte do I actually have to do work. So this is kind of the graph of what it looks like when my B value is only one, because I only really have to look at one byte, which happens to be the last byte in this case. So at first it's pretty expensive because it's the last byte. If it was the first byte, it would be really cheap. But, um, but then I can amortize that cost, and at the end I get super fast, spending like less than 10 nanoseconds per item. So that's a few cycles, right? That's like 20 cycles or so per item. Um, okay. This is the opposite case. What if I have a key that is huge? Like I have a sort key that's 256 bytes in size, like a standard array of lots and lots of ints. Um, in this case, my B number can basically go up, up to 256. Right, so, I, so in this we don't even see the waves because it just it just keeps on steadily going up as I have to look at more and more bytes. Um, so what happens here is I get slower, but I never get slower than standard sort. And there's two reasons for that. One is I don't actually have to look at all the 256 bytes because um, often I can tell the elements apart just after looking at the first byte because they all have, all have a different value in the first byte or maybe in the second byte. Or, and then I'm like, oh, there's only 10 elements in the subsection, so I just standard sort and finish it off. The other reason why uh, I don't get slower is that standard sort also gets slower because it has the same problem that I have because it also has to look at more and more bytes in this, in this huge key. At first, it only has to look at the first few bytes. But then as I get more values, you get more values that have the same values in the first few bytes and it has to look at more of them. So it also gets slower in this case. Um, the other thing that happened here is that I removed scar sort copy because this is the case where it's really, really expensive. And uh, there's a few other cases where it's really expensive, but this is also the reason why I didn't talk about it in this, um, in this, in this talk. I liked having it in there so we'll be able to point at it and say this is what O of n looks like, so that we have a comparison. But otherwise, um, yeah, it has a few cases where it's really slow, and so I, it's, it's off the charts at this point because it would be way up high. Okay, uh, here's a case of what if I have a huge struct. This is just like a 1k struct. And I tried making this number higher and higher, and basically I get closer and closer to standard sort because at some point the choice of algorithm doesn't matter much because you're just paying for moving so many bytes around. Um, the point is just I never get slower than standard sort. Here's strings. Um, looks the same as when I have a long key because now the B number can go up to infinity depending on the length of the string. Um, here's what I have long, if I have longer strings, so now the line goes up more steep because my O of n times b can go up to a longer value. Um, and here is the final slide, which is sorting vectors of ints, where my b number can go up even faster because I've got four bytes per value, so it goes up like crazy. So I get much slower, but standard sort has all the same problems because it also has to look at all these bytes and it also gets slower in the same way. Okay. Um, so I say it's usually less than n log n. It's not quite O of n. And I like this O of n times b value best, even though the b value is a bit vague, but it explains all of these graphs. And okay, the other thing I did is I benchmarked against spread sort, because I made two claims. The first claim is I generalized radix sort, which for that I have to benchmark against another general algorithm, um, which was standard sort. And the other claim I made is I optimized it. And for that I have to benchmark against another um, radix sort, which in this case is boost spread sort. Um, so boost spread sort can run most of the previous benchmarks, but it can sort ints, floats, and strings. So I did those benchmarks. So when sorting ints, I'm usually faster except for that one case in the middle there. And uh, what happens there is that spread sort doesn't sort one byte at a time, but it sorts like one and a half bytes, or like 11, 12 bits at a time, roughly. Um, so, what, so what happens there is that its waves have a different size than my waves have. So I, I, it, I just get unlucky there where I hit the top of one of my waves as I hit the bottom of one of its waves. Um, otherwise, I'm mostly faster if I didn't have that one bad luck case. Um, sorting floats look similar. I'm faster, even though not by as much. Um, also depends on the random numbers here that I put in here. There's less range in those numbers. But that's just, yeah, random. Um, finally, sorting strings. And this one, I'm actually slightly slower than spread sort, um, which is a bit embarrassing, but it's, um, 
The reason for that is that they did, um, they have a few more optimizations than I have. I could do all the same optimizations, it's just that since they can only sort strings, they did a few string specific optimizations. Um, like they, as, they assume contiguous memory, for example, which I don't. Um, and so I could solve this by putting a specialization into my algorithm for standard strings specifically. I just haven't done that yet. Um, so for now, I'm kind of the same speed, but slightly slower than spread sort for sorting strings. But I'm still faster than standard sort. Yes, question. What are the string length differences? Um, the string length, I believe for this one, um, what I did is I, um, I went to my ETC words list, so I and then I just picked a bunch of random words, and I think I picked between like five and 10 random words. Um, and then I just built a huge array of those like five to 10 random words, and I sort that huge array. I think that's, that's, that's what I sorted here. So the strings are, I don't know, between 20 and 100 characters long, I think. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. For me, it's a common, common case where I sort pretty much the same length of strings. Mm. Uh, 10 characters, 20 characters. Yes, if you know, if, if, yes, so the comment is, um, somebody has, has a common case where all the strings are the same length. In that case, you can actually use the other algorithm, the copying sorting algorithm if you know the length ahead of time. But that's, yeah, that's, that's too much for this talk. But, um, yeah, so I cannot take advantage of that, but other algorithms can take advantage of that, of knowing the length ahead of time. Okay, um, final section is um, real world performance and how do you use this yourself? Like how can you go home and, and use this? Um, so this is where I actually use this algorithm at my work and measured how long do, how much did I improve things by using this algorithm? Um, so I have kind of complicated cases because if you just want to sort by an int or if you just want to sort by a string, that's tri trivial. You just return that from your sort key. So I, I'm showing a few cases where it's more complicated. So you can believe me that this can also handle complicated cases. So here's something where I wanted to sort something called a data lookup and it has this sort info struct and we're getting the key and masking off some bits and returning the, the pure key, which has the bits masked off. And we're just comparing by that. This is what it looks like in standard sort. This is what the comparison function looks like. Um, in scar sort, this actually simplifies slightly because um, I only have to return one key. I don't have to do the comparison. So I just return the key with the bits masked off. And then internally, it does all the right things. And it, because it knows this is a UN32 and it does all the right things. Okay. Uh, so bef I ran a few, I just did some measurements in our game, like, few cases where we had to run this. And so on average, it's like something like 20 to 40% faster. Depends on the length of the list. And so if you remember all the benchmarks, like the, the, we're more on the left side of those benchmarks where the difference between standard sort and scar sort is not as big yet. And you can also see these are like pretty fast ones, like measured in microseconds. But that's what I got here. Another case is, um, good, I'm back on time. Uh, Another case is, this is this is another complicated case where I have a generic comparison algorithm because I want to sort two different lists by the same, in the same order, and then iterate through them in parallel later. And so, who can tell me what this does, what this sorting algorithm does, or what this comparison returns? It is lexicographic, yeah. <laughs> yes. It is lexic or it sorts by sender first and then by receiver. Um, yeah, so this also becomes slightly simpler in, in mind because I only have to return one sort key. I return make payoff send ID receive ID. That puts them in the right order. And like it, it's also easier to read now because you know I'm sorting by this first and then by that. Could you not use tie there? The question is could I not use tie? I could totally use tie here. Um, it happens that these are just integers. So returning them by reference would just make this slower. But I could totally use tie here, yes. And I think because scar sort is stable, right? It is not stable. So the question was, is, is this stable? And this is not um, a stable algorithm. Hmm? Sorry. So it didn't fix that bug of lexical sorting with a non stable sort. Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite catch that. Presumably, the, the goal of the code here was to sort the senders and receivers that still have a match up. Yes, yes, but. This is not stable. Yes, no, but this was never stable, right? Yes, yeah, so we, we, we want to have them both match up. 
So we, want, we can iterate through them in parallel, right? So we can iterate through both at the same time and always get the matching value in the other array. Um, but it doesn't have to be stable to do that, to, 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 to get them in the same order. We just have to like provide enough information in our sort key to get them in the order we want. Good. Um, here is how long that talk takes. I just ran one benchmark a few times. Um, and this is so almost twice as fast. So we're more than, we're more towards the right of those benchmarks, but the difference gets bigger. And you can also see this now takes longer. And so my speed up gets bigger. Um, good. That brings you to my conclusion sli slide, where I first tell you that you should keep learning your algorithms, because I only learned Radix Sort last year, and it's kind of fun to work on them. Keep trying to find improvements for them, and if you find an improvement, write about it. I hear all the time how people like knew about improvements for a long time but never told anyone. What kind of people just doing ad hoc things. Um, for performance, the conclusion is should write code so that the CPU can do more than one thing in parallel. So you get more instruction level parallelism. This only gets more important. Like as I said, my, my CPU can run four instructions in parallel. The new AMD Ryzen com computers are running five instructions, five instructions in parallel. So that's kind of what Moore's law does to us nowadays. Like that's, that's where they spend the transistors. It's like, so we have to take advantage of that. And the final conclusion is you should use, you should use this. Uh, cool, thanks, that's my talk. <laughs> and I think we have like 10 minutes for questions or so. I'll say this, yes. So how do you determine when you fall back on um, just a sort? Is it the same for all cases? It is. How do I determine when to fall back on standard sort? It's, it's, it's the same in all cases, um, except for a few edge cases. But um, I, what I do is I just say, if the list is less than 128 elements in size, so I do that both at the top level and at each recursive level, I'd say, is this recursive level less than 128 elements in size? If yes, just, for, just call standard sort and finish, up, finish it up like that. So even for the second byte? Yes, even for the second byte, yes. And there's one more edge case where I use standard sort, which is, um, if I do too many recursions, if I have to recurse like down to the 15, 16, 17 byte at some point, I just stop it and call standard sort. Um, because at some point I hit like a really bad case there, which I have to detect and, and, and um, well, there's one potential input if, if that, that I can hit a bad case and I detect that and also fall back on standard sort. Yes. So um, are you using lib standard C++ or lib Clang or LV? The question is, which standard library did I use with this? And I think I just used GCC with lib standard C++. If you're using a lib standard C++, uh, instead of calling std sort, you can call the heap sort, which std sort indirectly calls. Um, and the recursion goes um, much like uh, 15 or 16. That way you bypass the std sort in that case. Yes, so the comment is, if I use um, that lib standard sort, I can just use call uh, heap sort, which standard sort uses internally. Um, I don't do that because actually what I want is I want that for very short lists, I want to use insertion sort. For longer lists, I want to use quick sort. And I only want to use heap sort if quick sort hits its bad case. And that's exactly the behavior that standard sort has. Standard sort does quick sort. Well, if a list is less than 16 elements in size, it does insertion sort, then otherwise it does quick sort. And if it hits a bad case of quick sort, which detects by how many times does it have to recurse, then it falls back on heap sort. And so, I like that behavior, so I just call standard sort. Like it, it works great for me, and it, it makes it fast. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Have you looked at the partial sort or the sort on a condition? Have I looked at partial sort or sorting on a condition? Um, so sorting on a condition, you could just return a boolean from your extract key function, and then this will do the right thing. So I'm not uh, aware you you want a partial sort, but you don't know ahead of time how oh. many elements you need. Oh, okay. So you want a partial sort, but you don't want to sort the whole array. You only want to sort like the elements that fulfill a certain condition. Is that what you so, want? So a partial like sort. Element. Partial. Or like, like the nth element or? Right, or well, uh, nth element would be another algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't do, um, I don't handle that case yet. It seems doable to handle that, where what you would do is after the first byte, so you still have to do the normal thing for the first byte, and then you would determine which Subpartitions actually fall into this range that I care about. Mm -hmm. And then you only recurse down to those and you skip all the other ones that you don't care about. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried that, I don't know. Yeah. Yes? 
Uh, many times the standard algorithms uh, give different kinds of guarantees depending upon whether the more memory is available or not. Mm -hmm. So in all the standard sort like the insertion sort, quit sort as well as uh, peak sort, mm -hmm. uh, none of them requires any extra memory. Yes. Uh, so I was just wondering uh, if we have compared those SK sort is that right? Scar, uh, Scar. Yeah, I just named it after my last name. Yeah. Because yeah. okay. so, I was like, how often am I going to invent an okay. algorithm? It doesn't. So, like, gonna if we have compared that with other algorithms which do not uh, adhere to the those guarantees of extra memory. Yes. So, the, um, the question is that the standard sort algorithm, it guarantees that it doesn't use extra memory. And uh, have I compared to algorithms that don't make that guarantee, like that are a bit more uh, loose? Um, I have not, um, and the reason is that standard sort is just the fastest comparison-based algorithm there is. The other ones, or so the ones that use more memory, actually the only one I'm aware of is, is, is like stable sort that uses more memory, and that um, is slower than standard sort. And it, it uses more memory to give you the stable guarantee, but so it would have just been high up on, on, on those comparisons, it would, so it wouldn't have been as interesting. Like um, merge sort, I guess. In merge sort, you can use extra memory. Yes, yeah, merge, merge sort is, is stable sort, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So the, the reason I'm saying is that many times, like, if you're just looking at the sorting application in isolation, mm -hmm. then using extra memory is not a problem. But actually, if you gave the real world examples as well, like, if I'm using the this algorithm in my uh, application, mm -hmm. I have now a problem that this might evict the cache lines which were important for other things that I was going to do. Yes. So, so, so yes, in the in the real world application, uh, like I would have to add this to my application and then profile further, which, which, which you sort of did with yes. two examples. Yes. So the comment is um, this: in the real world or in the real, real world application, you would sometimes worry about how much extra memory it uses because then it evicts all your cache lines and all that stuff. And this algorithm will certainly do that because I allocate a lot of memory on the stack. And especially if I request down into multiple bytes, I can allocate like 8K, 10K bytes on the stack. Um, <coughs> I, I haven't run it on anything that is a pretty short list. I only run on things that are longer lists. So usually it takes like hundreds of microseconds anyway. So if you come back from that and then your, your cache is gone, then I think that's to be expected. So, yeah. Uh, so one comment. I just sent uh, to simply now Slack chat a uh, really good link with a lot of with library, which consists a lot of sort algorithms, includes SCA sort, etc. Mm -hmm. That sort, press sort, and uh, you can find a lot of benchmarks. And uh, tonight maybe I will add more benchmarking. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there was a comment from the audience that there's a. In the Slack channel of C++ now, there's, there's a link to to a comparison of to a library that compares this with a lot more other benchmarks that somebody has nicely done. Actually, I use that to answer my own question here, which how does this compare to like TimSort? Um, the answer is TimSort is faster where you expect it to be faster. In if your list is almost sorted, TimSort is faster. Um, but I still compare pretty well in like um, an average. The other thing about that is um, there was actually a guy in my comments on my blog post that had, he had written an adaptive sorting algorithm and he had adapted his adaptive sorting algorithm to work with SCAR sort internally. And that ran really fast, even both on the pre-sorted case and on the not sorted <coughs> case. Um, I had been meaning to take that into my, into my algorithm as like the official implementation, but I just haven't worked on this since then, so I haven't done that. Yes. As a, a very minor possible optimization, have you considered replacing um, size t with int or integer? Yes. So the question is, um, as a minor optimization, have I considered replacing size t with int or smaller types? Um, uh, yes. I used to do that. Um, in, my, in my first implementation, I actually did that. So on the on the stack, I, I would say, oh, instead of size t. If, I'm, if, my, if my list that I'm sorting is less than 65,000 elements, I just use a u in 16. Because um, I know... I mean, go, go from an unsigned to a signed type. Oh, to a signed type. I have not tried signed types. Um, I think you wouldn't get any 
benefit out of switching to a sign type because um, the since I'm using size T, I'm already using the, the type that's native for the machine. So it already will use the fastest instructions. Like the only benefit you get from... Um, necessarily. Not necessarily? There's, um, signed types often have more um, optimization. Stories. Yes, the common is signed types often have more optimization. As far as I'm aware, that's um, mostly the case if you, um, if you have a smaller um, um, type than what's native for your registers. So if you have like a UN32 and, and you want to do math with that, then the CPU has, then the computer has to like run, choose instructions that give you the correct overflow guarantees and all that. Um, and that slows you down. But as far as I know, that is not a problem with if you use a full um, size T, because then every single thing you write translates directly to one machine instruction. And it, there, there are other optimizations. For instance, if you increment an unsigned integer, yes. uh, you, you, the compiler doesn't know that it's now greater than it was. Okay. Yeah, so the comment is um, there's other optimizations, like if you increment an unsigned integer, the compiler doesn't know that it's now greater than it was. I I haven't tried using a signed type. Maybe I should. Uh, I just... It, it's not very sort of yes. integer-heavy work. It looks like it's mostly the, um, moving data around. Yes, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I basically only use this to like do pointer math internally. Right, that's the only thing I use the the integers for. Yes. Well, we're, we're talking about the integers that you make an array of 256 of them. Yes, we're talking so, about those. So shrinking their size by half might actually also help with the cache. Yes. So that was the comment that what I first thought was the question. Like, what if we shrink the array that's on the stack by in half instead of using a size t, we just use an int. Yeah. So we use four bytes. Um, I used to do that where I had four versions of every single. Uh, algorithm where I would say, depending on the size of the list, I would I would I would just say is the list less than what 256 elements, then just use a single byte. Is the list less than 65,000 elements, then use two bytes. Is it less than four, four billion elements, then use four bytes. Um, I used to do that, but I measured it and it was like I I couldn't measure a really big difference. And what it did do is it increased my compile time by a factor of four because now everything was instantiated four times. Um, so I, I I tossed that optimization out because it didn't make a big difference. But it might make a small difference in a few cases. I don't know. Um, yes? Another very optimistic suggestion. Did you, did you try um, uh, two bytes instead of one byte? Did I try sorting in two bytes at a time instead of one byte at a time? Um, I didn't. Um, spread sort does that. Or what spread sort actually does. Let me see if I can go back to... So spread sort sorts like more bits at a time. It sorts like 11 or 12 bits at a time. And actually decides at runtime how many bits it's going to do at a time. Um, that is also one of the reasons why it's a bit harder to generalize because now it, it, it's like um, if you just do one byte at a time, it's very easy like to get at the lines between, like for example, two bits or something. If you want to sort 11 bits at a time and you want, have to switch from one element and two bits to the next, that's tough. But um, I, th I think that there is optimizations to be had there. I think if you sort more bits at a time, there's, there, there might be speed-ups there. Um, well, well, 16 bits is a nice round number. Yes. So 16 bits, um, yes, yeah, so the common is 16 bits is a nice round number. So if you did 16 bits, you would have to have a stack array of 65,000 elements. Um, and then you could do two passes. Um, what I've seen instead is that you do 11 bits, then your stack array is 2048 elements and you can do it in three passes. So like that, you could, like that, that's the lowest number where you save exactly one pass on like a four byte uh, integer. And um, what I have seen on that is that what that does is it shifts these waves, it shifts them over a little bit. And um, I still have the suspicion that if you, that there could be an optimization there where you always choose a number exactly right so that you always hit the bottom of these waves. You never hit the top of these waves. Um, so if you would hit the top here, like at that point, you will instead sort 11 bits at a time. And then you might be hitting the bottom of the 11 bits wave. Um, I still think that might be worth to try. But the other problem with that is that these waves, like here, they're super regular because I just have uniform distribution ins. If your ins are not uniformly distributed, these waves don't look this regular. So, um, yes, and, and the common is ins normally are not this regular. So I don't actually, I, I would need bigger data sets to properly evaluate that optimization. 
what I have found is um, is that when I tried sorting 11 bits at a time, there was a small section that was faster. And it was like basically this section like around 2048. It was, was faster than exactly that section. Everywhere else it was slower. And one byte at a time was just the fastest in most of these ranges except for a very small range. Um, and so, and, and I, th I think that's because the CPU kind of likes working one byte at a time. And um, so there's like, it's a small range where 2048 <laughs> is better because the math, like, if you look at the math for radix sort, then like they actually say the number you choose should be roughly the same as the length of your list. And, um, but um, yeah, so there's a small range where it's faster, but outside that range, it's, it's slower. So you would have to tweak around and find that range. And um, I haven't done that yet. And I probably actually won't do it. Because <laughs> like this is, this, like that, that, that's something for other people to do if they want to optimize this further. Yes. So, um just the last question on your slide, like what cannot sort? Oh yes, um, what can this not sort? So, there's a few, oops, that's one too far. Unordered set. <laughs> yes, unordered set, <laughs> but nothing, no, no, no. I sort. <laughs> Never mind, I cannot go to that slide. There we go. No, that's my bear. I like that bear. I don't know, I can't go to that slide for some reason. There we go. Um, what can this not sort? So. Um, the, yeah, I know what said, obviously, but standard sort also can sort those. Um, I can sort the non-random access containers, right? So if you have one of those, I can sort that. The other big case I can sort is um, Unicode strings or anything, any string sorting algorithm where you want to have other than the trivial one. So if you have like, um, so I don't support case insensitive sorting. Like, so if you want to sort strings, but you don't care about the case, I don't support that. I think that particular one is somewhat easy to support because I could change my extract key function to just do the do the casing, but I don't do that yet. I, well, the reason why I don't do that yet is because I was looking for a good customization point to offer up that would allow people to just say, "Oh, I want um, I want case insensitive case insensitive sorting," but I never found that good customization point, so I don't support it. Um, but yeah, so most cases are. If you don't have random, if you don't have random access, or when sorting strings, there's a few cases that I, or there's a few very common cases I don't support, and for those you have to continue using standard sort. Yes, another comment. For, I mean, thinking of it in the generic programming sense, uh, <coughs> thing that you could sort with a comparison-based sort, but doesn't have a sort tree, so you can't use this to sort rationals. Yes. Right? Because rationals, you'd always know which words the bag is likely to be or vice versa, and yet there's no. Yes. The other comment. They're not lexicographical. Maybe. Yeah. So the comment is this cannot sort rational numbers because um, rational numbers are easy to compare, but it's hard to put them into a specific slot in those counting arrays. Um, and then somebody else mentioned that maybe it's things that are lexicographical, but I'm actually not sure what the criteria is for things that I don't handle, like things like rational. I'm not sure there. I mean, because basically, if you can make a sort key that you can compare lexicographically, yeah. then you're good. Yeah, I mean, you could try turning your you could try turning your rational into, into a double and then sort on that and hope for the best. Well, sure, but that's not a rational. Yes. Yeah. No, but, but you would only do it in your extract key function, right? So and then hope that that gives you the right precision. I don't know. So uh, depends on how, how how good you want this to be. You could find your right common denominator also. And actually, given that you do that optimization where once you get down to a small partition, you switch over to a sort anyway, yes. which is comparison based, yes. it would work most of the time. <laughs> yes, the comment is if, if, if I just sorted rationals by casting them to double and then hoping for the rest, it actually would work most of the time because I, if the, if, if the list is short enough, I switch over to sorting to using standard sort. So when it comes to like twiddle between numbers that are that are close to each other, I use standard sort anyway, so it would work most of the time. Actually, it doesn't because I call standard sort with your sort key, with the key that you give me. So it would still call standard sort with the double. So I think it would still work most of the time. As if you're just dealing with rationals, you're just dealing with integers, whereas once you're into the double land, you're really not using the full register set. Yes. Yeah. So let's just say I don't support 
rational numbers. And, and so there's a few cases that this doesn't sort. So I think comparison-based sorting will continue to be used, but I think this can sort a huge number of things that you currently use comparison-based sorting for. And just to be clear, when I said rational, I meant like actually, like rational big moments. Like, it's just a pair of bands. Yeah, you can sort that. Yes. You just use the same kind of trick to be used to sort floats. Okay. I think we're actually out of time because it's 10.37 already. Don't worry, we have a break. We have a break, okay. So, um, yeah, I think we can leave this in. But yeah, thanks everyone.